<laughs> so once again, a uh, heartfelt welcome to all. Um, this event is entitled Global Urban History Project Meets Utadu, a trialogue on theory, history, and global South urbanism. I'm Carl Nightingale, I'm co-coordinator of GUP, the Global Urban History Project, and I'm co-host for this event. Our meeting today fits into many ongoing series of events. It's the latest in what we at GUP call dream conversations in urban history, in this case, the conversation on theory of, for, and by urban historians. And that's organized by a committee that includes Rosemary Wakeman, uh, the president of GUP and Alexia Yates, both of whom are in the audience, um, along with my co-hosts for this event, one of my co-hosts for this event, uh, Kenny Coopers. Professor Coopers, uh, thanks for your special leadership in organizing this event, and especially for your awareness of the word trialogue. I didn't know it existed. <laughs> and uh, it humbles me to learn about it from a non-native but excellent speaker of English from uh, Northern Belgium. The, uh, the event is also the second in which has become an annual symposium within that conversation on urban theory from the global south. Uh, there was an event last year and participants from that event, um, which was recorded and which can be viewed on our GUP YouTube channel. Uh, they're also present uh, today. Um, and uh, their work also just came out in a series of essays in the online journal Antipode um, that I, you, I sent in a link uh, on the chat. Finally, and most importantly, it, uh, this event also inaugurates what we hope will be a multi-year partnership with Utadu, uh, the African Urban Studies Workshop, led by my co-host, other co-host, Wangui Himari, will tell us more about the mission of her collective uh, shortly. Uh, finally, I wanna acknowledge collaboration with the African Urban Dynamics Research Collective and the Lagos Studies Association. A special welcome to those who are joining us through the auspices of these uh, very highly dynamic organizations. I want to note that our audience consists of scholars joining us from six continents. We have a, an ambitious agenda for today. Nothing less than opening a trialogue between three groups that on most days only see each other from very far apart, global urban historians, urban theorists, and practitioners who work, whose work involves tackling global south urban challenges with forward-looking solutions on a daily basis. We're very lucky and privileged also to have Professor Kanishka Gunawardina to lead us into that agenda. And it's hard to imagine someone better positioned to do so, as we will elaborate shortly when we introduce him as our primary presenter. One last bit of logistics before I hand the mic over to my co-host. Um, we have allotted uh, an hour and a half for this session, but given its ambition, we're open to extending it as needed. Um, and uh, you know, this is a topic that probably could be, as we were noting earlier, the, the subject of a, a multi-day conference, um, which we hope eventually to, uh, this is, will lead that way uh, ultimately. Um, we're, we're recording the event just so that we can, um, we can pass it on to those who are interested, but uh, cannot make it this time and can then uh, catch us up as we move forward. Uh, without further ado, Wangui, are you available at this point um, or should I pass it on to Kenny? Please pass to Kenny, although I am here, I'm just catching my breath, sorry. Oh, okay, sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, while Wangoi is uh, coming from, a, I think, an everyday experience of uh, Nairobi, being stuck in traffic or being late, um, I'm, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Kanishka Gunavardana. Um, we had the pleasure of meeting last year when uh, um, um, Kanishka taught a course on urbanization and imperialism at the uh, Critical Urbanisms Program, and so I'm very excited to have him here. Um, Kanishka was introduced to questions of space, Marxism, and imperialism in Sri Lanka, where he was trained in architecture at the University of Moratua and began his career as an architect at the Urban Development Authority. He is a professor of geography and planning at the University of Toronto and one of the world's leading experts on critical urban theory with a special focus on the relations between space and ideology, the politics of planning, and uh, the triad of nationalism, imperialism, and colonialism 
in relation to contradictions of capitalism. He has written on the Marxist, French Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre and produced a, a moving examination of the idea of totality embedded in the planetary urbanization theory. His current projects uh, deal with the historical geography of the concept of imperialism, the history of left politics in Sri Lanka and Marxist uh, thought, and I think also in other places uh, that he is currently uh, exploring uh, on his sabbatical research leave. I give you the floor, Kanishka. Okay, thank you so much, you know, and thank, thank you. Uh, uh, it's an incredible privilege to uh, be with this group, you know, and I'm uh, uh, conscious that I'm a newcomer, you know, to this uh, uh, endeavor. And uh, uh, so I'm going to uh, try to uh, uh, say a few words, uh, 10, 15 minutes, uh, okay. I hope. Uh, 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 as a you know, simply as a prelude to uh, some real discussion later, you know. So, uh, uh, so I uh, you know, I, and I prepared for this by uh, looking at uh, a Google document that uh, Carl and others have prepared, uh, where you know, where various people uh, mm -hmm. uh, wrote you know uh, uh, issues and questions that they would like to discuss. I'm not going to go over all of that, but uh, I just want to say that when I uh, looked at some of the comments on that document, I was, you know, of course, you know, I realized that there are many, you know, incredible questions, you know, that we need to discuss in greater detail, you know, ideally, you know, in a longer conference or workshop, as Carl suggested, but uh, but when I was reading uh, what was written, I uh, was extremely curious about, uh, you know, what uh, experiences, you know, what uh, uh, biographical and other uh, uh, circumstances uh, actually led people to raise these kinds of questions, right? Uh, because if you, when you sometimes just read a journal article or something written somewhere and you don't know, you know, where the person is coming from, uh, it's uh, not that easy to understand, you know, what is being uh, asked or said. Uh, so uh, with that uh, kind of thing, uh, you know, the, with that sentiment in mind, I want to uh, uh, just say a few words about, you know, where I come from. And uh, and as a uh, kind of a, uh, to provide some context to some of the key uh, things, uh, you know, key uh, uh, points that I would like to uh, introduce uh, I, again, uh, only as a prelude to uh, 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 a discussion. So I, uh, as Kenny already said, uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, I grew up in Sri Lanka and I was, uh, you know, about 24 years old before I first left the country, you know, so I was trained as a, uh, as an architect uh, in, at the University of Morotua in Sri Lanka from the mid to late 80s uh, at a, you know, during a very uh, politically turbulent time in Sri Lanka. It is always turbulent, even last year yeah, and currently as well. But uh, mm. so uh, so while I was studying architecture uh, at the university, uh, you know, we were politicized in the streets, you know, because of the general political situation. So uh, my kind of uh, initial uh, uh, reading uh, on in politics and even uh, you know what we might call theory, uh, you know, including a kind of a random article by David Harvey. You know, I remember. You know, uh, uh, all that happened actually outside the classroom. You know, in various uh, political discussions and reading groups and so on. So I have this sort of a relationship to theory that uh, that is not. Uh, academic, let's say, you know, because it kind of came from, from like actual practical circumstances, right? Uh, and for this reason, I've also taken theory, you know, very seriously in my, uh, you know, subsequent academic work. Uh, but always, you know, with that kind of uh, practical uh, uh, motivation, you know, that uh, very much in mind, you know, that uh, first led me to kind of uh, theoretical uh, and political kind of uh, inquiry. So after finishing architecture, I worked uh, for my mentor at the university, who was a great designer, 
but very quickly in the conditions of Sri Lanka at the time, uh, you know, I, I just couldn't kind of continue, you know, for too long designing houses for the one percent, you know, of the country who could afford architects, you know. So I quickly kind of, you know, after a few months of, you know, very nice design work, you know, I joined the government in uh, uh, the Urban Development Authority as a planner, more or less. You know, I was officially still called an architect, but uh, but I was doing planning and especially uh, involved in the uh, low income housing uh, program that was very uh, important uh, in Sri Lanka at the time called the Million Houses Program. Uh, and uh, so from inside this uh, Urban Development Authority and the uh, housing program uh, uh, of the country, I got a like an insider's view of how planning works, you know, in the area of housing, uh, urban development, and also within, you know, various uh, <clears throat> conceptions of national development, uh, you know, which is all, you know, very exciting, but at the same time, extremely frustrating, because you could see <laughs> from the inside, how politics, you know, both in the good sense and the bad sense really work, you know, so that kind of experience was what actually led me to uh, think about grad school and you know in the rather sort of uh, utopian and perhaps naive belief that uh, well if i kind of had a master's degree or a phd i can come back and kind of you know work at a more influential level and have a greater uh, uh, influence you know and a greater say in how planning actually worked you know so Anyway, the, then I did a master's degree in urban planning at the University of uh, Southern California from 89 to 91 uh, during the heyday of uh, neoliberalism in American, you know, uh, the academic uh, world. And this is actually one of the most uh, neoliberal planning schools, you know, I discovered after I went there, uh, the, which was, you know, an interesting uh, place for me to be, you know, coming from Sri Lanka with that kind of political uh, background, uh, you know, trained in the left, you know, Marxist uh, traditions. Uh, so it was a pretty interesting experience, you know, with me and my professors uh, always arguing about, you know, uh, what is this, you know, and, uh, uh, and which, you know, quickly led me to uh, a PhD at Cornell University, which actually was the most uh, radical planning program in the US, you know, and, uh, and I remember, you know, choosing between MIT and Cornell uh, as a, uh, you know, and I chose Cornell because I noticed in their curriculum a uh, course on reading Marx's Capital, you know, so the, uh, <clears throat> uh, but at Cornell, I got, you know, kind of sucked into critical theory, you know, the, the you know, kind of reading a lot of Althusser, Gramsci, the Frankfurt School, and that kind of sting. And so I try to, in my kind of doctoral and subsequent work, kind of combine all of that, you know, my experience as an architect and my politicization in Sri Lanka and my discontents, you know, with the neoliberalism of planning, uh, you know, and the potential of, you know, using, you know, various uh, for kinds of critical theory, uh, in the sort of the Marxist kind of tradition that I was already familiar with uh, to uh, bringing that kind of theory to bear on uh, 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 important questions of planning, architecture, and the production of space, as uh, Andre Lefebvre uh, uh, put it. So that's pretty much my uh, my background you know so uh, and i'm sure we, we all have our own you know uh, fascinating stories you know about how we came to the uh, kinds of uh, places where we are you know writing and thinking from right and uh, so in the discussion i it will be nice to compare some notes i think you know uh, alongside the specific questions you know that we want to uh, or the issues that we want to uh, discuss so looking again at the 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 way the discussion is set up and that uh, the, the Google document called Trilog in advance that I mentioned, I think we are, uh, the way I understand it, you know, we are talking about three different, uh, I mean, three related, uh, very important issues. You know, one is the relationship of theory to practice. Right, and uh, so there are a number of questions on this uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, on this theme, which we should uh, return to. 
uh, which we should discuss. And the second uh, for me is the extremely important and also you know very problematic and difficult and challenging uh, relationship between the north and the south, you know the center and the periphery. So here, you know, with regard to this question, you know there's a great deal that has been written in uh, uh, urban theory recently by people like Anna Neroy, Jennifer Robinson, and many others, you know, talking about the importance of, uh, let's say, decolonizing the Western theory and, uh, you know, kind of bringing uh, Southern uh, or Third World uh, or form, like colonized, you know, perspective, you know, formally or even currently colonized uh, perspectives, you know, uh, into uh, especially, you know, the theoretical uh, discourse on planning and uh, and cities. So the uh, so I'm of course, you know, uh, very much, uh, you know, sympathetic, you know, to these uh, efforts, right? But I think uh, this uh, this uh, project of you know decolonizing theory, let's say, or you know, as uh, so, you know, somebody else has put it, you know, provincializing Europe, you know, in the discourse of uh, the, uh, the theory that is relevant to us, uh, uh, you know, this is a bit easier said than done. You know, so so there are some uh, important questions, you know, to deal uh, to that we need to address. Uh, but anyway, this concerns the relationship between the north and the south, the center and the periphery, metropole and peri uh, the colony. Uh, and it, of course, you know, uh, 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 forces us to confront the history of uh, colonialism and imperialism, you know, in a very direct uh, way and to uh, deal with uh, the repercussions and the consequences of that history in the very institutions and the discourses within which we operate, right? You know, so this is a very fundamental challenge. Uh, uh, I won't say too much about it uh, at this moment because uh, if I get started, you know, I probably won't be able to stop. You know, but the uh, but let me just say uh, anecdotally that uh, there's a, uh, you know, uh, challenging as this is, you know, there, there's a lot of great work, you know, being done on this kind of question. And this is why I'm extremely excited to uh, join all of you, you know, be, uh, and especially, you know, people working on uh, various countries in the African uh, continent and people from these countries which is, uh, uh, to my shame, you know, is a continent that I have not been able to visit, you know, uh, yet. Yeah, but I, I, I would dearly love to kind of uh, go there uh, uh, and learn more about uh, what is really uh, ha happening, you know, especially in relation to this uh, uh, north-south kind of question. But I did have the opportunity to, you know, you know, I'm from South Asia, you know, so I know how these questions are, you know, uh, discussed, you know, in places like India, for example, right? And uh, and I have also living in the Western Hemisphere for the last, you know, twenty uh, odd years. I've had the opportunity to visit uh, some uh, Latin American countries and especially uh, Brazil, you know, so I was there like, uh, like, you know, just a couple of weeks for two, three weeks, you know, very recently. And, uh, and there is a, you know, some great scholarship, you know, about how, uh, you know, this north south kind of relationship in the in theory is uh, addressed, you know, so so a bunch of scholars in uh, uh, Belo Horizonte, you know, uh, have been among the foremost readers of uh, Henri Lefebvre and critical urban theory. You know, so they have, uh, they translated into Portuguese, you know, the right to the city the year after it came out during the military dictatorship in Brazil, right? You know, long before it appeared in uh, English or any other language, right? Uh, so they have read, uh, these are colleagues in uh, Belo Horizonte, uh, so this is a kind of a really great uh, book about uh, 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 how to use, you know, certain kinds of critical theory, but in, in uh, uh, peripheral or dependent uh, conditions, 
right? You know, so it's not the Lefebvre that you find in Europe or, you know, in North America, but a, a quite a different uh, appropriation of Lefebvre, uh, just for example. And, uh, and uh, the, uh, you know, for to address uh, conditions of uh, uh, urbanization in, uh, you know, dependent uh, conditions, you know, and so obviously in Brazil, you know, they draw from uh, dependency theory uh, and various perspectives on imperialism and colonization to uh, deal with these questions. And uh, just very quickly, I also wanted to show in Sao Paulo, you know, so the, you know, colleagues, again, you know, you know, somewhat ind independently, in fact, from uh, people in Belo Horizonte, have produced another, uh, so this is uh, spatial justice and the right to the city, uh, the, uh, the critical uh, urban geography, uh, uh, the urban crisis, uh, and the city as a commodity and so on, you know, so, so there's a kind of a, really interesting body of work uh, engaging uh, some uh, of, you know, the most radical currents of metropolitan critical thought, but from uh, the, from a, a, a Brazilian, you know, or a, you know, per, a peripheral or dependent uh, perspective, right? So, uh, so that is the North-South stuff, you know, so the and and the third uh, thing that we want to uh, discuss, I think, uh, concerns the relations between different disciplines, academic disciplines. You know, so the so history, uh, urban studies, uh, geography, right? Uh, so there's again a lot to be said, but I think I already exceeded my 10, 15 minutes by you know too much. You know, so I'm going not going to get into this right away, but I think you know. Uh, the some of the questions uh, will obviously deal with you know the how different disciplines you know can speak to each other, uh, but also address you know in a uh, kind of a, a useful practical real world kind of way you know the the great uh, challenges of urbanization, especially as the they are experienced and presented to us in. Uh, uh, peripheral and you know non-Western kinds of situations, but you know, but uh, in a way, <laughs> I think it is it is also becoming increasingly evident that even in the great uh, you know metropolitan cities, there is a growing periphery, a third world of sorts, you know, and uh, so the so these uh, questions are not uh, not uh, irrelevant, you know, in the center uh, uh, either, right, and. Um, and finally, I uh, I want to end uh, with a kind of a uh, again kind of a to like a bit of a you know I started with a biographical kind of a um, uh, statement right and I want to and that is also because I'm interested in hearing about your uh, stories as well uh, and uh, but uh, maybe I'm kind of moved in this kind of direction because I was. Uh, asked to write a couple of things. You know, one, uh, you know, our great uh, uh, historian and uh, urban studies scholar, Mike Davis passed away recently, right? Uh, a few months ago. So I was, uh, you know, I knew Mike Davis, you know, from my time in Los Angeles. And he was a great uh, inspiration to me. Uh, uh, for my, most of my work, in fact, yeah, especially the work on space and ideology that Kenny briefly mentioned. Uh, so I wrote a brief uh, tribute, you know, to a like an American left magazine called The Specter, you know, and uh, and I gave also a lecture at the University of Sao Paulo while I was there recently on the work of Mike Davis called uh, uh, Marxism and Storytelling, you know, space, time, you know, and theory in the work in the writings of Mike Davis. Uh, so I think uh, you know this, and also you know, there's a, this new book that is published on David Harvey, the uh, whole woo of David Harvey, I guess, you know, and uh, by three uh, radical geographers. And I was asked to review this for an academic journal. So I've been kind of thinking about people's uh, biographies, you know, people's lives, and how that actually helps us understand, you know, what they say and write and how they think, right? So with that thought, uh, with that remark, I will stop and uh, we can take it from there, however you want. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Kanishka, for, for those really um, thoughtful remarks. Um, and uh, I, I hope also provocative of, of, of questions. Um, I'm gonna, um, we have a couple of things we, we uh, agreed to do. One is to, to allow people who did contribute to our advanced um, dialogue to bring anything that they want to bring forward uh, in the beginning. But I think even before that, Wangri, what, would you mind just telling us a little bit of the project um, that you're making a big part of your life, um, Utadu in, uh, in Nairobi? Thank you so much, Carl and Kanishka and Kenny. I'm sorry for being late. I was just navigating many Nairobi things. And hopefully one day, Kanishka, the invite is always open for you to come and experience Nairobi. And I'm here really uh, because of the village that Global Urban History Project have provided for me personally. I was a, I was part of the project program last year, I was receiving mentorship and through Carl's very big generosity, uh, I think now he's a good friend. And since then we've been trying to collaborate on a number of things. And one of them, I'll, I'll just see if I can put it uh, here is uh, a kind of, it's a summer school, even if we don't have summer in Kenya, I, <laughs> we don't have many seasons, but we are calling it a, a critical urban studies summer school to try and democratize the resources needed to make uh, urban scholarship about African cities more inclusive. And so both scholarship and imagination more inclusive. And if I can speak briefly to biographies, how, I, how we came to this was because having had the privilege as a middle-class Kenyan to study abroad and coming back home, the, the great deficits uh, in what is available for students were really quite jarring in that students in Kenya don't have access to journal articles. Uh, they rarely have space to have a, to think beyond, and you spoke about dependency theory. For us, I think where we stopped, the theory stopped evolving because partially because of structural adjustment programs, and so we are stuck on globalization. I think we've just touched on globalization. So if you go to a class in, in Nairobi, it's theory is not very innovative. It's not very inclusive, uh, even in the context that we're in. And so we, we try and create this collective village to offer uh, three days of theoretical grounding, one day to, to ground with uh, artists also to enrich our own understandings about the urban and one day to ground with activists. And we've been lucky to do this uh, because of, it doesn't cost a lot to run, but mostly we're partially because we're many of our friends bring themselves to offer. Um, uh, the program before I stop talking. And, and just to say this, this um, I'm really happy we're here talking about theory and history and global south urbanism because part of what Utadu would like to do is to think about I mean we, we just don't want to take theory uh, Lefebvre verbatim and put it in Nairobi but we want to think about what it means for our cities how it can improve our African city thinking or how can we nuance it so Utadu would like to respond to theory we'd like to respond also to the histories that have been written about our different cities. In Nairobi, for example, a lot of the history of the city is written without women. So you would think that women came to Nairobi in 1963 during independence because the British government didn't want to deal with Africans, but then it also didn't want to deal with uh, detribalized African women. And so this, so we're also thinking about history, but we're also thinking about global South urbanism. And I think where many people I know are, are trying to contribute to a framework or have done a lot of work, many of whom are here, that uh, creates this scaffolding for what Global South Urbanism is. But we also insist we're Global South Urbanists or in uh, urban spaces because our governor, our state doesn't want to think about us being Global South. So we are insisting on this Global South framing in context also where 
the formal positioning is to to run away from uh, what is global south. So, oh, just to say we're we're happy to be here and collaborate. This is the program for this year, and we're very grateful for all the our lovely friends who are bringing themselves here. Also, Kenny, and I'm here if there are any questions. And thank you, Kenny and Carl, for doing all of the labor uh, to make this happen. Thank you. And welcome again, Kanishka and anyone else who wants to come to Nairobi and um, to be part of the Utadu village. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wangbi. And uh, also a, a reminder that this is an ongoing, uh, the Wangbi is committed to a number of years of, of producing this each each year in this in uh, north what's in the, in the global north is called the spring, um, and uh, so so uh, keep in mind that those programs are are um, is is a long project just like we hope to um, build um, starting today as well. Kanishka, do you want to respond at all to what Wangui has said um, at this point, or can I open it also to? Um, and can I open it to uh, questions? If you want to make a, if you want to ask a question, please put your uh, hand up, and you will appear in order. So I'll be able to to, to call on you. Yeah, I think we can open it up to questions. You know, and I think Wangu, you know, raised an important issue about like how to kind of relate to theory. You know, coming from the West. You know, for example, the fab. You know, so I'll I'll, I'll have a bit more to probably say on this, but I let's I hear from everyone else, you know? Yeah. And also to highlight uh, that there are people who were involved in last year's um, events, including Wangbi herself. Um, Abdul Malik Simon is, is also here. who he was a commentator last year. Um, so uh, the, uh, I'd love to hear from, uh, from you as well as you see this um, working out uh, in, in re relation to the to the last year's discussions. Give people a sense to a second to, to formulate questions. Well I can I can uh, try uh, to um, Put together uh, uh, one one thought I have for you, um, uh, Kanishka, which is just the word uh, global. We have we have the word global in our global urban history, and the intent of that um, is uh, comes from the fact that basically urban history, institutionally anyway, is a highly north global north phenomenon. There's the, the two biggest institutions are in Europe and the United States. Uh, there are a couple others that um, uh, that are also pretty much l lodged in 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 Europe and and North America, and our our one of our big goals was to um, create an association where urban historians from you know across the world would be uh, welcome, and uh, where we would get a much better and much more fuller sense of of urban. Um, there's a second mission, which is to think of cities as both the creations and the creators of larger scale, including global phenomenon. And uh, and yet, I think also, you know, the word global can appear um, often and rightfully so as a kind of stalking horse for global south perspective, global north perspectives. Um, sort of a domination of global north perspectives in global south, uh, you know, to, to, so that so that there's a kind of a homogenization that uh, it, it can it can bring. And I wonder, um, this this seems to have some uh, resonances with a, a concept that you wrote very eloquently about um, in 2018, uh, the concept of totality in in um, urban theory. You know. Historians are pretty uncomfortable with the idea of totality. <laughs> we, we, we like to see things change. We like things to be um, unpredictable, um, if sometimes continuous. We are aware of power um, imbalances and inequalities. 
Um, but we also see them as, as, as you know, rupturable in various different ways. And, um, uh, and yet, um, you know, I, think, I think we also have tendencies on our own um, to uh, privilege Global North perspectives and call them global. Uh, it's kind of a Trojan horse <laughs> kind of way that uh, interferes with that. And I'm, I'm wondering how we how we sort of um, decolonize global, if, if you were, or, or um, detotalitize, detotali, I don't know what the word is. Um, Kenny, you probably know because you, your English is better than mine. Um, uh, you know, what, how, do we, how do we do that? Um, and yet, you know, re remain open to the idea that, you know, cities are, connected to each other. Um, and, you know, things that happen in every city matter to every to cities everywhere. Um, as the worlding hypothesis of Anand Roy and others in, in I Will Ong suggests. Um, and, and that, you know, really is a, a fundamental part of the idea of doing global urban history is that cities everywhere um, as, as, as sites of research are, are important to cities elsewhere. So just uh, just to throw that out to you uh, first of all, and then it looks like we're starting to get some hands. So we'll move um, move around the the room at that point. Uh, okay, so maybe I'll, I'll start some uh, attempt to kind of uh, say at least a, uh, something provisional, you know, about this. There's a big question, you know, and and unfortunately, you know, totality is a kind of a, has become one of those. Uh, 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 you know, like a flashpoints, you know, like, you know, uh, like a, almost like a, a fetish word, you know, that uh, concentrates the, all the, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, a lot of love and hatred at the same time, you know, to the concept on, from various sides, you know, so the, uh, so sometimes it's kind of uh, very difficult to talk about this without kind of uh, you know involving you know too much uh, you know passion you know so the, uh, let's say uh, and in fact you know that paper that you mentioned you know planetary urbanization and totality was written in the con context of some like crazy debates you know within the field of geography and urban studies centered around the works of uh, Christian Schmidt and Neil Brenner, uh, who were trying to kind of extend a you know, fairly sort of a straightforward Lefebvrean kind of a concept from the urban revolution, kind of, you know, anyway, like, you know, there's a lot of debate about it and uh, all, anyway, I, we don't need to go into that too much, you know, but uh, uh, right now, I don't think, but, but for me, you know, totality simply means like, uh, you know, in the most commonsensical way of putting it, like, you know, having a bit of a holistic perspective, you know, about what's going on, you know, and, uh, and, uh, and in the philosophical sense, you know, this is what actually totality meant, right, you know, for people who kind of used it in a theoretical philosophical sense, but over time, you know, the word acquired all kinds of negative connotations, you know, for understandable reasons as well, you know, so the, uh, but, uh, but I, I, I stick with it because for me, you know, uh, you know, having worked through the original kind of philosophical formulations of the notion, it simply means like an attempt to understand things uh, in a holistic way, right? And, and such an understanding as Carl very nicely put it, must of course, you know, be attentive to uh, the contradictions, uh, possibilities of change, uh, and also, you know, unequal power relations and all kinds of contestations within the whole that we are talking about, right? Uh, so it is a concept that, in other words, uh, must be capable of uh, uh, registering to the fullest possible extent, you know, what we call imperialism, colonialism, and North-South uh, relations, among other things, you know, so, uh, so for, so for me, uh, you know, the concept basically has a you know, positive connotation for me, you know, I cannot not, you know, so it, it, the verb totalize for, to me, simply means like, okay, think holistically, right, you know, uh, it may not be what it means to other people i understand okay so the uh, uh 
uh, uh, but the important thing is uh, not the word, okay? Like we can get rid of the word totality and use some other word if we want, okay? So the, uh, but the important thing is to kind of understand uh, things uh, uh, in a holistic way, but with due uh, and, you know, clear attention to the, uh, the contradictions, the struggles, the contestations, and the discontinuities, uh, all the surprises that are possible, uh, and so on and so forth. And it is the point of you know thinking about totality is not to kind of worship, you know, the system, uh, whatever it is that exists. You know, so I, you know, always uh, when I use the concept in my uh, courses, I say the point of understanding the totality is to get rid of it, you know, and and you know uh, to kind of you know. Uh, find a, a different one, you know, different world, you know. So the, uh, so with that kind of, uh, in that perspective, I think you know the most important thing is to kind of uh, figure out uh, where uh, we, as uh, both uh, theorists or practitioners, can make uh, strategic and useful interventions, you know, in whatever we do uh, in the urban field. Let's say broadly understood to make a real difference, you know, to the system, right? And and to kind of figure out, you know, these possibilities, I think we need to understand the system, you know, that we are up against, right? And and that that kind of understanding requires a holistic way of thought. And for me, you know, again, having worked through the philosophical origins of the concept, uh, totality means precisely that kind of uh, effort, right? Yeah. Th thanks so much for that. And I, I also want to just, you know, say that I felt feel like it's a very humanizing and humanistic uh, understanding of, of the term. And I would just, you know, I would like to, to honor the work of historians by saying that, you know, we, we also like to think of that as uh, as involving much longer periods of time as well. Um, so, you know, for example, pre-capitalist, pre-industrial, pre-imperialist, um, uh, uh, not that there is much pre-imperialism, but certainly pre-North, um, North, global North imperialism uh, kinds of, of, of possibilities. But uh, I'm gonna pass it on to Stephen Legg, who um, is a, a longtime uh, global urban history uh, member, but also um, a geographer and theorist in his own right and an expert in South Asia and a really important voice um, to have today. So Steve, you take it away. And thank you. Um, thank you for this invitation. It's just, um, um, I apologize, I've got teaching in 13 minutes, so I'll just make this quick. I wanted to um, <clears throat> invite um, Kanishka to um, perhaps expand on a theme addressed in one of his recent papers, which is um, the Geographiska Anala paper, where the, the subtitle was For Anti-Colonial Struggle to Authoritarian Neoliberalism. And I've been thinking for a while about how we can tease out in terms of the the interest of this, this group, thinking about urban history and contemporary urban challenges. What we think the legacies were of what we might call anti-colonial urbanism. So how anti-colonial um, practitioners were using and remaking cities. And I'm thinking here historically about anti-colonial practitioners in the period of colonialism. So not anti-neo-colonial practitioners. And just thinking about what the legacies of those sort of works might have been in terms of how cities went on to be developed and reimagined after independence. And I've been trying to think of three ways. When we think of anti-colonialism, we often tend to think of political revolutionaries, underground networks that were real training grounds for politicians uh, in the post-colonial period. But also there has been some attention on those people who were just doing the sort of day-to-day -day work of training as municipal engineers, town planners, architects, um, but also people who were reimagining and remaking cities in the imaginary realm before independence through poetry, painting, um, novels. But when we find anti-colonialism spoken about in terms of urban theory, it tends to be a little bit more abstract, um, or we tend to think of anti-colonialism as an ongoing project which is fighting new forms of neoliberal um, capitalism. So given that you, uh, you used the term in your recent, a recent article, I'm just interested if you have you come across ways of thinking about how anti-colonialism as a pre-independence um, series of 
urban makers and reimaginers had legacies and how we can think of that as having legacies rather than just continually thinking of it's the colonial state which leaves all these legacies for post colonies to deal with. This is such a great question, you know, so uh, the, uh, you know, so this, uh, uh, yeah, maybe like, you know, I should ask uh, uh, Stephen to uh, himself to kind of, you know, answer his own question, you know, a little bit, you know, the before the 30 minutes, you know, before he has to leave, you know, so, uh, but uh, the, but very like you know because you know what I like about the question is kind of uh, I mean one thing I like about the question is kind of the the expansive way in which he kind of formulated it you know involving the work of artists and uh, uh, writers and you know many others you know working in the you know the period of uh, you know formal colonialism itself uh to produce uh, all kinds of radical and utopian imaginaries you know of uh, uh decolonization and you know and uh, you know from my own kind of political perspective you know that this was also a time of uh, the production of a lot of uh, ideas of uh, you know socialism you know from the south actually you know so the uh, the you know with you know, and this is where I think, you know, the question uh, of the relationship between North and South in terms of critical theory, broadly speaking, becomes extremely interesting, you know, so, uh, so I, I can think of, uh, uh, you know, just off the top of my head, like various uh, kind of uh, registers or examples to which to think of this uh, kind of uh, question, you know, so, uh, and I think the, the, uh, the book, uh, written by uh, uh, um, uh, uh, yeah, I'm blanking on, like the my good friend you know so the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, it'll come to me in a minute you know so but about kind of you know how uh, 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 architects and planners from the former you know socialist world you know played a you know significant role uh, in the you know some of the you know developments in uh, arab and african you know uh, cities right and uh, the yeah Ro rosemary has a hand up you know yeah okay so the uh, the but uh, so the uh, so he uh, and i you know already mentioned you know uh, my you know friends and colleagues in brazil you know and i know that you know this is a place a country where uh, architects and planners in particular, you know, have had, uh, you know, really, you know, interesting radical ideas about what, uh, you know, kind of, you know, decolonized uh, or post-colonial, you know, uh, radical left cities could be like, you know, and we can kind of still see uh, this kind of uh, 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 legacy you know in uh, brazil and other parts of uh, latin america to some extent you know in their particular appropriations of the ideas of you know right to the city you know and so on right and uh, and here you know i think you know going back to a point that uh, wangui raised uh, earlier it is a, not a, uh, in my view, you know, it's not a matter of like, you know, simply kind of uh, taking some European theories such as Lefebvre or whoever, you know, like, but, uh, but, kind of, but uh, reading and uh, appropriating them in, uh, in a particular, uh, you know, uh, context, you know, with uh, special attention to the uh, histories of you know colonialism and in the case of Brazil slavery you know and uh, and uh, as well and uh, and the continuing you know peripheral uh, uh, situation and location of these kinds of cities. So the 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 Sao Paulo you know the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism in Sao Paulo like you know was set up with the very explicit agenda of you know the kind of addressing you know the housing question you know and. Uh, uh, and uh, the and a very kind of a progressive uh, uh, kind of a socialist uh, agenda almost you know for the training of architects in uh, in this uh, school uh, the uh, yeah and I I kind of uh, you know and and but 
to look at it more broadly, uh, you know, there's a great deal of in India. You know, I'm kind of, you know, you know, a couple of my friends have actually written about you know various. Uh, uh, you know, the Indian people's theater uh, group, you know, like uh, writers, you know, uh, dramatists and uh, filmmakers, you know, who uh, produce, you know, these kinds of radical imaginaries, you know, uh, starting in the uh, late colonial period, you know, and who had, you know, a significant political uh, influence in post-colonial developments as well. Uh, so in the paper that... Uh, was mentioned uh, that Stephen mentioned. I think you know what what I was trying to uh, deal with, you know, in the context of Sri Lanka in particular, is kind of how the like an earlier kind of a, a wave of you know radical thought and politics kind of uh, became uh, overrun, you know, by the in increasing hegemony. Let's say after, in the case of Sri Lanka, after the mid seventies, you know, by the uh, hegemony of uh, neoliberalism and you know this neoliberal kind of globalization, you know, so the left uh, uh, cultural production, you know, politics, uh, including uh, uh, you know, in the, across the arts, I would say, uh, kind of uh, suffered, you know, because of this uh, rise of neoliberal. Uh, globalization and the cultural ideological kind of a dispensation that comes with it. Uh, and in fact, you know, in the new uh, uh, era, like or the current era of, of post 80s, you know, globalization and neoliberalism, much of the social uh, antagonism and discontent, uh, especially, you know, as experienced in cities, uh, uh, was expressed, you know, along cultural nationalist kinds of lines, you know, which in the case of, you know, Sri Lanka and India sometimes leads uh, into very uh, regressive, you know, forms of uh, cultural nationalism, which, you know, some uh, friends of mine would even call uh, neo-fascist, right? You know, so the, uh, so we see uh, kind of a, this also as a disturbing trend, you know, not only in the, you know, global south, uh, you know, in India, Sri Lanka and other places, but also in the, uh, in Europe, you know, uh, uh, and even in America, in the US, you know, so the, uh, so there's a kind of a uh, shift from the, the more European radical kind of a left, you know, uh, imaginaries, you know, towards these sort of, uh, more nationalist, uh, identitarian, you know, and fascist uh, trending, you know, uh, uh, responses, you know, to the real discontents, you know, of uh, neoliberal globalization and how uh, uh, these uh, new, you know, this kind of uh, global economic uh, processes are experienced in the everyday lives of uh, cities. So I'll just leave it there, but, I, but if there's a bit of time for uh, Stephen to add to his own question, you know, before he has to teach, I would welcome that. Just very brief. Uh, I think I think along those, those lines, um, I, I mean, I think the way I'd approach it is just doing very sort of careful incremental studying of the, of the sort of biographies and institutions which um, Sort of transgress that period of independence and then what they became. So I work on Delhi, the Delhi Improvement Trust became the Delhi Development Authority, but lots of the techniques, the assumptions, the statistical models, the people, the training were actually continuous all the way through just with a sort of tweaked ethos that we become more people focused and we don't just think of slums as statistics. The, the theatre associations you mentioned um, in Delhi, like Manto was writing um, Urdu novels about the pre-partition city that then he'd left, but that partition novel form was established. Um, and many of the people who were anti-colonialists end up coming on and becoming municipal socialist and communist members and disrupting the, the, the new municipal governments as much as they did before. So, but, but what I think in all of them is that there is this, um, there's a grounding of work done to imagine and start rethinking the urban that's taking place beforehand, which it doesn't seem to me that there's always space for in the narrative of what the post-colonial urban is, which is you know, World Bank, colonial state, but I'm just, I'm trying to find ways of bringing that legacy in. Apart yeah, very, very important, you know, to bring back those legacies, you know, and, and I think, I won't say more right now, but leave it to others, yeah.
Thanks a lot, Stephen, for bringing this this question up. It's a it's a perfect nexus for the the trialogue in a lot of ways. You're talking about practitioners in history that are uh, handling handling various forms of 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 uh, that there have theoretical implications that are very important. Uh, Rosemary has been waiting, and then Kenny, and then uh, please uh, line up as your as your questions develop in your minds. We'd love to hear them. Thanks, Carl, very much. Um, I'm going to just introduce, I think, a, an, a, an associated question um, that I left in our documents as well in relation to these imaginary geographies that have been placed over what we now call the global north and the global south. And um, it's very typical, I'm an historian, very typical of an historian to raise the question of temporality. Um, and I, I wonder how viable uh, this terminology is uh, given. Uh, global warming and given the crisis of migration that is now taking place. Um, and I raise this because it seems to me that uh, geography has been in flux, world geography, global geography has been in flux um, throughout the 20th century, right? And it strikes me that we have named and renamed our relationships and this bifurcation, East, West, Occident, Orient. Now, uh, brick countries, for example, is another a really interesting one from a neoliberal perspective, development, underdevelopment. Um, so the, these geographic imaginaries have been with us and shifted uh, substantially over the 20th century. So um, the global north and the global south is what we use now, and it captures um, far more the reality of colonialism and the post-colonial condition. But as Kanishka mentioned, there are now global Souths um, in all of these cities as well. And we use the terminology of formal and informal in some ways to try and capture that. Uh, so, wh so what are we left with, I guess, and how viable is the idea of the global North and the, the no global North and global South, given the reality of, that we now face of global warming when discontent and protest uh, can be just as well captured in the fluidity of migration and the enormity of migration, both into the city and also uh, away from uh, these various countries into the global north. So, what are we left with under those conditions? You know, how are we capturing this? Um, is the the idea of uh, post-colonialism still a viable framework in which to capture this? Uh, do we need uh, to build on that in some way? So these are these are simply reflections um, in thinking about this material and how we can capture these geographies and to a certain degree build on the critical geography that has been left to us by David Harvey and by Kanishka himself and by Lefebvre, right? So I'm I'm pushing us forward in trying to reimagine this. Okay, maybe I'll. Uh, this is a great, great uh, thoughts, you know, and questions, uh, Rosemary. You know, so uh, the. Uh, but can I uh, also hear from Kenny? Uh, he has his hand up, and you know, we we can, you know, also like you know, this conversation doesn't have to be centered on me. You know, so we can all try to deal with these uh, very important questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think a lot of us want the, the conversation to be centered on you, Kanishka. So we'll have happy to hear from you more. But Kenny, sure, why not do two two questions? Uh, even though Rosemary's was huge, um, uh, Kenny, Kenny, why don't you uh, uh, bring in bring in your thoughts too, and then maybe maybe Kanishka, you can take take oh, it from there. Maybe I'll try try to change the the dynamic a little bit to take some some of the heat off you, Kanishka, that you have to answer all the difficult questions that are being raised for you um maybe to start uh, with a comment on 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 um mary rose's point um i i guess yes these are imaginary categories but they also have very real um, um consequences in terms of uh you know what what infrastructure projects are fundable uh you know how how people move etc so um i guess i would be interested in thinking with how these concepts work in the world um and then what how we might shift the perspective in order to make visible the work that they do in the world. Um, so rather than staying with a particular concept um, uh, or a geographical, like say, you know, the vision of the world, uh, methodologically, I'd be more interested in kind of per perspectival pivoting to ask, for instance, what, you know, what does southern urbanism do in a place like Nairobi or, or coastal cities versus something like Indian Ocean urbanism? 
um, and to think uh, with those concepts um, in, in, in pairing or, or from one to the other and uh, to better than see um, the kind of analytical work that they do for us. And maybe that's also to think about a different scale of concepts. So um, personally, I'd be, I've been more interested and in, in inspired by or um, mobilized by, I guess, um, concepts like Black urbanism or Indigenous ecologies or decolonial ecology, not as some kind of overarching concept that allows us to understand uh, the world or to replace capitalism as a concept, but rather uh, to see how we can think with that in specific places and how those places relate to the planet, uh, the world, or can be seen as a way uh, in which uh, we can understand the kind of world-making capacities of things in that in, in that particular place. So to, to move also between, uh, let's say, the local, what we often call the local and the global, uh, but to think with that in, in, in other categories. Um, another, uh, maybe very briefly, if I may, to respond to Stephen uh, Legg's question, and if I can um, plug here um, Wangoi's work on, on Nairobi and Madare, um, I think there is a long history of anti-colonial urbanism uh, in, in Nairobi, but also in relationship to the countryside, if we think about these networks of, of uh, anti-colonial organizing, um, and I think they very much shape um, life in, in what are usually called informal settlements. And so the work of history then for me would be to not write a global history of informal settlements, but rather to see how Madare is as different from, I don't know, central London as is the bidonville um, of Algiers. And to understand um, these places in which the urban majority lives, not as all the same or even comparable, but um, you know, relationally, but also very divergently or differently. Okay, Mayor, th thank you so much, Kenny. You know, the, uh, this is helpful, you know, very helpful uh, 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 for all of us, I think, you know, and, uh, but let me kind of try to return to some of uh, Rosemary's uh, question, you know, at least kind of the way I can try to make sense of it, you know, uh, and say something hopefully useful, you know, so, uh, because, you know, I, 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 I really, uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, agree that uh, you know, and and I, I deal with this, you know, some of the questions you raise, you know, pretty much every day, you know, like all, every time I kind of you know use a word like north, south, and and so on, you know. So the uh, uh, and that is, uh, and as you said, you know, you know, we got to think about time and we got to think about space, you know, in a in a kind of a radical, open-minded way, you know, and. Uh, to kind of figure out, you know, the, well, you know, how politics is kind of, you know, configured, you know, like for us, you know, and how we can also uh, intervene. The, and the, the other uh, important thing that we haven't really much discussed, uh, at least today, you know, uh, is the whole, you know, question of, you know, how we relate to uh, nature, right? You know, kind of the, the whole kind of, uh, uh, you know, nature, society, you know, relationship, you know, as it connects to uh, uh, the development of capitalism, urbanization, and the rest of it, you know, so the, uh, so I, I, I mean, I do take some inspiration, I mentioned Mike Davis already, you know, I think, you know, his book, you know, <laughs> Late Victorian Holocaust was a kind of a, a real eye-opener for me, you know, kind of in terms of like thinking about, you uh, uh capitalism colonialism and uh nature you know uh, uh you know all together right you know kind of uh and in, i would say you know you know as a totality you know so the uh but but i think the 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 you know what is uh, the challenge uh posed in rosemary's question is really about uh i mean you know geographers have you know in the last 20 odd years have in a way tried to address this, you know, and that is, I, I don't mean to say they have the answer, you know, but I, I mean, you know, the, that, uh, but there's an, there has been an attempt and that is uh, through the, through an elaboration of the concept of scale, right? Uh, because, you know, we tend to, uh, or there's a, you know, default kind of assumption to when thinking about imperialism and colonialism to take, 
the nation state as the you know uh, default unit of analysis, right? You know that you know uh, relations of uh, imperialism and colonialism are often thought to uh, operate you know uh, uh, you know in the relations between these uh, units called nation states you know some dominate others and so on but but of course you know the real uh, uh, world is uh, you know you know the but the nation state as a unit does not capture the you know, or even begin to capture the full complexity of uh, the uh, kinds of you know relations that we want to uh, uh, get a grip on you know so the uh, uh, so there are uh, 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 inequalities, uh, you know, forms of uneven development, let's say, you know, uh, within countries and even within cities and regions, right? You know, so uh, so so we have to have a way of kind of uh, 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 putting all that together. You know, it's not that, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, countries uh, have you know stop dominating or exploiting other countries but uh, but there's a lot of other stuff going on too you know at other spatial scales you know so we want a kind of a a multi scalar perspective let's say you know on relations of uh, domination and contestation right and uh, uh, so i think this is you know with i mean i'm not saying this because i'm in a geography and planning department but i think you know there's something to be taken from you know what some geographers have uh, contributed to this kind of discussion such as you know neil smith you know neil brenner and uh, and others you know and there have been very intense debates about it as well so uh, uh, and i'm also Kind of, uh, and we did mention, uh, you know, the notion of uh, informality at some point, you know, the in this uh, conversation today, and I think there is a uh, uh, early like attempt to kind of theorize this by by this uh, very important uh, geographer, you know, from uh, Brazil, you know, Milton Santos, you know, he's uh, probably the leading radical uh, geographer uh, from Brazil. And there's a you know bunch of his books were translated into English you know three of them you know relatively recently and uh, I was you know happened to be involved in a kind of a symposium on his work organized by a geography journal uh, and you know since I you know as, as I said like I've been kind of visiting Brazil and interacting with colleagues there you know I have some awareness of this and he's one of the first people in the 70s to kind of you know. Uh, uh, work, you know, from a critical perspective on this idea of informality, what later, you know, came to be known as informality. He didn't use that term. The But he proposed, and with reference to dependency theory, you know, which is, of course, again, very strong in Brazil, like, you know, with uh, especially, you know, uh, as, uh, you know, theorized by uh, Rui Mauro Marini, uh, again, uh, recently translated work uh, uh, from Monthly Review uh, press uh, the so uh, so Milton Sandoz you know had this idea of you know two circuits you know like a formal circuit you know and a like a kind of a uh, like you know the high finance and official governmental business and you know uh, uh, that kind of stuff uh, operates and then the uh, like a lower circuit you know that operates you know in relation to this higher circuit. Uh, but which is, you know, involves, you know, what we call like informal and, you know, precarious work today. Uh, but uh, a circuit that is uh, also uh, primarily re responsible for the uh, for social reproduction, you know, of uh, the lives of the of the people of these uh, uh, cities, right? And uh, uh, so the uh, so he this too for me is kind of like you know like an interesting way of like doing multi-scalar analysis you know so the top circuit you know the higher circuit links all the global cities you know high finance you know global capital like into kind of one uh, sort of uh, system and uh, and uh, kind of tied to that but also distinct from that is the lower circuit you know that is uh, uh, you know, in a way, also global because it is, it is all around the world. But you know, it kind of has a more of a national, you know, urban kind of a uh, localized, you know, scalar existence. But uh, but it is uh, fundamentally uh, responsible for um, uh, social reproduction.
action you know and and i do want to kind of at some, maybe this is the moment to say something about social reproduction you know so the uh, so in in a certain uh, strand of uh, uh, kind of you know moment in the development of theories of imperialism in the 60s and 70s you know emmanuel wallerstein and you know others you know who actually uh, had an interesting training you know in their work, through their work in uh, various african countries and they spent some time in the the legendary you know university of dar es salaam you know in the late 60s and 70s and and i i think i talked briefly about this with kenny and this explains my uh, extreme you know interest and fascination about this particular moment you know of uh, like you know in the uh, you know in tanzania and you know other african countries uh, kind of you know uh, uh, the theorizing, you know, imperialism in this way. But anyway, Wallerstein, uh, uh, you know, proposes this concept called uh, semi-proletarianization, right? Which I think is uh, uh, utterly uh, important one, you know, for us to uh, kind of rescue and revisit in some way, you know, the uh, uh, because it has sort of been forgotten, you know, so along with much else from this time, you know, so the... Uh, the, so semi-proletarianization means that you know when capitalism uh, goes you know to the periphery, it is not interested in you know turning everyone into a wage worker, you know like uh, you know uh, the way it happened you know in in uh, Manchester and you know in the say, context that you know Engels wrote about you know in the condition of the working class in England or Marx in Capital for example, but. But they they kind of uh, the the capital you know metropolitan capital or imperialism uh, to be blunt about it has an interest in actually not fully proletarianizing you know the periphery you know because you know then they can kind of uh, let uh, these you know kind of you know uh, uh, you know sort of you know semi capitalist uh, space uh, uh, for social forms. Uh, they can uh, give the responsibility of social reproduction, you know, to, uh, you know, these uh, semi-proletarianized uh, 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 social forms, right? And uh, so the, and I think, you know, uh, we also, as, of course, as we know, like, you know, you know, several uh, strands of feminist theory over the last uh, uh, 30 uh, odd years, have uh, pointed out the importance, you know, of uh, social reproduction, you know, as a as a kind of a uh, something absolutely essential, you know, to the reproduction of the system, uh, and for social sustenance. And you know, this of course, you know, you know, involves forms of labor that are not, you know, valued or you know, uh, remunerated uh, by the law of value of capital, and you know, and so on. But the uh, but this is also kind of a, uh, you know, so social reproduction, you know, uh, uh, the way it uh, is organized in the peripheral conditions, especially, you know, uh, of urbanization, uh, I think uh, is a very important question. And, you know, I mentioned some of my Brazilian colleagues. And so one of the things that, uh, you know, a couple of people in Sao Paulo, like, uh, you know, recent, you know, PhDs, you know, I asked them what are they working on, and they're saying, okay, you know, we we, are, we want to, you know, uh, bring, you know, social So Kanishka, you, you've um, frozen for a moment. Um, also some- Oh, there you uh, are, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Like, uh, I think I lost the connection for a bit, right? I, I'm not sure, you know, so- yeah. Uh, anyway, like you know, so I I think you know, so we, we uh, because the, the, I didn't want to miss that you know discussion, you know, and the importance of social reproduction in in this discussion. That's why I wanted to bring it up in some way. Uh, but also, like of course, you know, to the importance of uh, uh, dealing, you know, <laughs> I mean, the very urgent 
matter, you know, a question of uh, challenge of uh, our relations to nature, right? You know, and and in the this kind of uh, the crazy, you know, kind of you know development of capitalism as we know it today, right? And uh, and uh, the so these are uh, some of the uh, most important challenges, of course, you know, and. Uh, so theoretically, again, to return to uh, Rosemary's question, you know, I think, you know, we need to kind of, um, uh, I would say, like, you know, there is something to be taken from the, the, the uh, question, like, you know, theorizations of scale, you know, that uh, that is very useful for us, you know, to figure out some of the approach, you know, some of the complexities, you know, of uh, the relations of domination and exploitation, you know, how they're kind of uh, constituted at various spatial scales. And in one of the lectures I did while I was in Brazil, you know, I uh, I did a kind of a, uh, an attempt, you know, a little bit crazy in my own head, but I think, you know, my Brazilian colleagues sort of, you know, uh, appreciated this, you know, I, I was trying to kind of read uh, Lefebvre together with Raymond Williams, his book, you know, the the country and the city, right? You know the, but also bring in this uh, completely unknown, you know, Sri Lankan, you know, political economist named uh, G. V. S. De Silva, uh, who wrote a kind of a manifesto, you know, in the early, uh, you know, in 1973, actually the same year that uh, Raymond Williams published the country and the city called some heretical thoughts on economic development, where he really kind of looked at the urban rural, you know, uh, relationship within Sri Lanka and the, and the challenges and opportunity that this kind of relationship presented uh, for a project of uh, genuine, you know, uh, I mean, like a real, you know, autonomous or socialist kind of development in Sri Lanka. And he kind of said, okay, like in Sri Lanka, it is actually a mistake to, uh, invest all the resources in the urban uh, at the expense of the rural because uh, the uh, the urban is a kind of a parasitic formation. You know, it, it lives off on the countryside. Uh, and uh, so it has a kind of a uh, relationship of uh, domination and exploitation to the, you know, Sri, Sri, the countryside of Sri Lanka, but it is like a satellite, you know, and exploited, it exists in an exploited relationship to the metropole, to London and Washington and so on, right? So, so there cannot be any on a prospect of an autonomous, you know, uh, authentic development in the urban, in, in these conditions. So it is better uh, to uh, spend our resources on developing, uh, uh, you know, rural capacity, you know, to kind of develop the forces of production, uh, industrialize and, you know, kind of make, uh, you know, the, the conditions better in the uh, countryside. And if this works, you know, then maybe, you know, this can be the basis for uh, more uh, independent and autonomous urban development in the country as well, right? So, at, but at the moment, you know, our countryside, our rural in Sri Lanka is doubly exploited, right? You know, it is exploited by our city uh, when uh, our city is exploited by London and Washington, right? You know, so, so, but this is where, you know, in the village, you know, that we got to start, right? You know, so the, uh, uh, so it is a very kind of a, anyway, this is my way of kind of putting together, you know, Lefebvre's idea of the urban revolution, you know, in uh, touch with, you know, Raymond Williams's, you know, great uh, history uh, through his literary criticism and all that of, you know, the relationship between the country and the city in the origin, uh, you know, with, uh, uh, you know, primitive accumulation and all that and the development of capitalism. But, you know, how then that kind of, you know, country city relationship with Williams himself says, you know, it's the prototype, you know, the er form, if you will, of what later became imperialism, uh, yeah, capitalist imperialism, that is uh, the, and how all that kind of, you know, uh, appears uh, from the peripheral perspective of Sri Lanka to a radical political economist like G.V.S. De Silva. You know, so this, this is sort of my way of, you know, let's say, you know, uh, staging a conversation between the North and the South from a radical uh, political perspective. Okay. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, those are very, very interesting uh, comments and thoughts. 
Um, we are uh, we have three uh, qu questioners that I want to just ask each of them to to pose their question in turn, starting with um, my friend Wangui Kimari and um, supreme uh, intellectual activist, uh, associational activist uh, from Nairobi, who's really been uh, really uh, uh, so, so impressive um, in in what she's been able to accomplish. Um, and uh, of course, we wish her well as as this as her projects go forward, and, and hope to be partnered with you as you as you do so. Go ahead, Wangui. Uh, thank you. None of that is true, but thank you so much, uh, Kanishka. And this is a question for everyone in, in the audience, um, if and everyone is free to share. It's more of a I, it's a pedagogical question, but I was wondering, and this is also building off on questions of scale and also different ref references from the references in India that Stephen Legg was talking about to Milton Santos to everyone else. But my question is, uh, for example, at Utadu, we are trying to rally uh, early career scholars who for the most part haven't thought about themselves as historical agents or theoretical agents or even uh, spatial agents. And so I was wondering whether, is there something that they read? Uh, so it's just really a question to all of you because uh, we are, yeah, we're trying to, while engaging with what we're calling global theory, also trying to rally these participants from different places to define themselves as historical agents and theoretical agents. And so I was just wondering if anyone has suggestions for reading and also Kanishka, uh, what you think they should read. Thank you. Eric, coming to us from uh, the State University of New York, um, institution that I am part of as well, a different campus. Good. Go ahead, Eric. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to, I, I mean, I think that we're running short on time, but I wanted to throw a couple of questions out there as much for Kanishka as for uh, Utadu members and organizers and everyone else here. And maybe it's the basis for a different conversation at another time as well, or at least part of it. But I'm actually curious to hear, since we have a wide group that does a lot of different things and a lot of different experiences here, um, the way that urban practitioners, activists, and people that are kind of engaged with grassroots politics in cities um, make use of or would potentially make use of academic urban history scholarship, such as many of the membership of, of GUP uh, produces. Um, and I, I mean, I'm generally thinking about how people make use of urban history of places that they work on, but also urban history of other places to get kind of comparative strategies or think about comparative structures, etc. Um, and I'm also interested in to what end this is, for who is this bit of urban history taken up and to what ends. And I'm thinking a little bit from my own research on South Asia, there seem to be a lot of different uses. There's a sort of heritage oriented usage of urban history, which very, very often gets tied, not always, but very often gets tied into sort of elite agendas for sort of aesthetics and use value of the city. Um, you also might have uses of urban history and senses of the urban past for legal claims, often on the part of subaltern turn or marginal groups of various kinds. Um, and then, of course, design planning and maybe architecture visions, which might have very, very different kinds of applications. But I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, as an urban historian, thinking about the articulation of the kind of work we do with people that are engaged in urban practice of various kinds, how do these two domains fit together? And how might that inform the kind of knowledge that we produce? Thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. Great, great question. Um, central to the, what we're doing here. Um, and Anandita Ghosh from University of Manchester, um, brilliant um, scholar of her home city, Calcutta, um, and uh, very much somebody who can can speak from um, cultures in a located space and their implications for a longer for, uh, and a global south urban space, and their implications for larger questions. Anandita. Thank you so much. You're always generous with your introduction. So I take that with a bit of salt. I don't know whether I'm that brilliant, but um, 
I, 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 my, one of my questions has already been uh, asked by Eric. So, you know, it, uh, for me, it was very exciting to come to this forum because I thought, well, we have planners, we have uh, people on the ground who are activists and working in this area, and we have scholars. What a great forum to have. So I think for me, as I was listening to uh, people delve into theory, I was thinking, yeah, but where does this actually then take us on this journey, which I know Carl right from the start is something that you're very, very interested in making, making these interconnections between various areas and, and between practitioners and scholars. So I, uh, and, and Eric phrased that much better than I would have. So, so that is a basic question. I think, you know, where do you go in this trial or where do you go from here? Um, the uh, other thing I, 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 I felt as I was uh, listening to various people, including Stephen, and, and you know, this also stems from my own work, um, and I'm not a great theorist, so you know I'm 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 somebody who uh, you know amongst I, th I suppose all, all the people I've heard so far uh, mentioned theory. I'm I'm not a theorist at all. So I'm a historian. I work with my archives. I work with facts. My work is much more textured and contextual than anything that grand theory can provide. And and I I was wondering, you know, in 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 all that you were saying, um, I I felt that theory could actually possibly, and, and, and pardon me for saying this, but it sounds probably a bit radical, uh, could actually be limiting uh, because it does not take into uh, account the small, the, the impractical, the bits that don't fit. And, and listening to some of the phrases that, that are coming up in the discussion, like informal, uh, the, the distinction between formal and informal, um, or, uh, you know, the, the, the phrase, I think, Anishka, you, you used, as you said, Wallace Stein uh, used the semi-proletarianization, semi correct. Um, um, I feel we are still dependent on theory in the ways in which that these phrases are being, being produced. So we, you know, and and how far is it a really um, uh, effective or practical representation or even realistic representation of the global south? And my worry is that the more we depend on theory, the more we end up reproducing the global north. So maybe there could be a different approach to move away from anything that we we presume, you know, these grand structures that that we presume will 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 have solutions and answers to our problems, and instead build on something that is of the kind that work that you to do is doing. And it's fantastic to hear about your work. I'm so excited to hear about that. And I'm so glad I came to this forum to learn about it, is to build from bottom upwards. So, you know, um, and I, I'm thinking of uh, things that cities had not even planned for. for and, and, and to give you a very, very real example of that, uh, a recent example of that is, the way in which cities in South Asia were, particularly India, uh, that I'm thinking of, and I say this, were affected by, by the uh, affliction of COVID. Um, and we have a huge informal economy sector in India, as I think those of you familiar with South Asia would know. So the formal economy does not ever take that into account or, or whatever structures we have catering to the formal economy completely ignores that. And we had these huge uh, 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 groups of people on foot, uh, we, we all saw this on, on, on the television and, and, and in images, um, on foot walking from cities to the villages once you know there was lockdown and they had to find their way, there was no transport, nothing. So there was, there was no way in which the in informal sector had been taken into account, there was no way. In which, so it's not just, I'm not, yeah, so it, it's, it's important to know about you know, the, those, those devices that you talk about between the rural and urban and you know do we do we really focus on this or the other but but i think at the basis of this are other configurations whether it's economic or even social in another interesting covid uh, 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 example if i may provide is uh, cities were afflicted during middle class people in cities were afflicted in south asia during covid because their maid servants left um, and they, for the first time, and they were very much dependent on, as we know, on, on these people to serve them. And, and the, the, the diaspora was frantically calling up, the young diaspora frantically calling up their parents to see, you know, how they were managing without the maidservants. 
and and it it was a real problem you know we might think of that not being important but i i'm really talking about you know bringing these aspects back into grand theory and and then seeing how we can work out from there rather than having it from the bottom downwards uh, sorry from from the up downwards but really working from the bottom up Carl, you're on mute. Sorry, busy, busy uh, uh, making sure that we document um, uh, things in the chat. Um, why, why don't we, why don't we uh, give it over to Kanishka one more time um, for a chance to respond to that? that that's a lot of ground to cover. Um, there's also the, the very important question on social reproduction from um, Abdul Malik Simon in the chat. He's no, uh, he's no longer uh, on the on the on the call, but uh, that's another um, question that's out there. And then Rosemary uh, uh, and, and Kenny will give you some chance to wrap things up. Perhaps we're getting getting um, we're, we're we're covering a huge amount of ground. Kanishka, why don't you go ahead to start though? Yeah. So yeah. So the I think. Uh, <clears throat> The, yeah, so let me uh, see if I, you know, understood Eric's important question. You know, so the 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 uh, you know this kind of you know uh, at least the part about you know how what kind of difference urban history can make. You know, so <clears throat> uh, for us, you know, so the or the work of historians, you know, and and I, you know this I should leave it actually open I mean you know I should ask the historians here you know to de deal with this uh Carl and Rosemary and others you know so but I'll, I'll, I'll kind of you know uh, I'll preface this by saying that you know the and here I'm uh, kind of anticipating I mean I'm addressing maybe <clears throat> at least the part that I can respond to from uh on it on Dita's you know question you know like about theory and so on you know so for me you know one thing that is important for us to do as a like a this kind of a global you know group you know that's uh, trying to connect many dots uh, is to uh, sort of uh, uh, you know I think we all each know you know like from our own uh, experiences and backgrounds people uh, and various groups that actually make, you know, useful connections between theory and practice, you know, but they often tend to be like localized here and there, right? You know, so the, uh, so, uh, you know, Wangui, I'm, I'm really curious to know more about your work, you know, like, and for example, you know, uh, it's really a, a kind of a, a problem you know like that you know somebody like me has not really been exposed to your experiences and work you know so i mean i happen to know uh you know some people uh, in uh, again you know to bring up my, you know my favorite example of brazil because i've been there recently you know people in uh, uh belo horizonte you know who i know best uh, in brazil like you know so there's a Kind of a very interesting uh, situation there, you know, at the Federal University of Minas Gerais, you know, they have a department of very great, you know, department of eco economics, you know, with uh, critical political economy people and, and a similarly interesting department of geography and a school of architecture and planning. And so this is one of the few places where I see economists, architects, planners and geographers, like really kind of, you know, at least the critical uh, people among these, uh, in these departments have a kind of a very uh, fluid uh, and active, you know, organic connection, you know, and they share students, you know, so there's a kind of a culture of uh, uh, interdisciplinary critical kind of a theorization, but in the context of actual practical engagement with you know real uh, you know problems of planning you know particularly in the areas of housing uh, and uh, community organization 
uh, you know, what they call popular economies, you know, and this is sort of their term for, um, you know, what some others might call the informal sector or the lower circuit of, you know, Milton Santos and so on. How to kind of organize uh, in these spaces, uh, these uh, activists. Uh, so there's a kind of a very, you know, inspiring for me, at least, you know, uh, kind of a combination of theory and practice, uh, you know, you know, involving professors, students and urban activists, uh, but uh, also combining, you know, the works of uh, economists, uh, geographers, architects and planners, right? And uh, and to some extent, I mean, I mean, this this, this, this is a very unique economics department. Uh, you know, they have uh, historians of economic thought and economic historians. So, so I would put like you know, in some way, some uh, historians also in that mix, right? So this is just one example, you know. And and I think you know, if we kind of scan the whole world, you know, we can find you know many other uh, such examples, you know, and uh, where theory and practice come together. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, and I'm you know personally kind of involved in one such group called the International Network of Urban Research and Action. You know, which uh, you know is mostly kind of a European-based group. You know, with some you know uh, uh, connections outside of Europe, but it is a group that uh, you know was formed in the context of uh, actual urban struggles. You know, in the late '90s in places like Zurich uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, Italian and French uh, and, you know, some German cities, you know, there was a wave, you know, of, you know, urban activism, uh, uh, like uh, 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 movement of squatting and so on and so forth. And uh, so out of this came, uh, you know, these activisms came this group, International Network of Urban Research and Action. And the, you know, the, so both, uh, you know, Christian Schmidt and Neil Brenner, you know, who, you know, uh, became notorious, perhaps, you know, in that planetary urbanization debate, they came out of that, that experience, you know, particularly Christian Schmidt and his, uh, his uh, um, work on Lefebvre, you know, began there, right, and uh, so uh, the so and you know so so I think you know one of our challenges is to kind of uh, share these experiences and knowledges you know across you know across many uh, I mean I, you know and I know similar groups in India uh, uh, and I'm sure there are many others you know like I've heard you know in South Africa the shack shack dwellers movement and so on and so forth you know so the so I think we need to kind of uh, uh, bring, you know, uh, resource, like, you know, pool all of these knowledges and resources, you know, like in some way. And I think, you know, one of the, what, what I like, what sounded really promising in this uh, discussion, you know, when Carl initially invited me was that, okay, this is going to kind of, you know, expand my horizons a little bit, you know, I mean, you know, not a little bit, but substantially, you know, like, uh, on what's happening, you know, in uh, places that I know very little about, you know, but uh, uh, so there's a lot of stuff going on, you know, that we need to, we can draw from, right? And uh, the, and and we, it's a matter of like kind of uh, bringing to our consciousness, you know, and awareness, you know, uh, uh, you know, things that are already happening that we may not really know about, you know, because of the way academic institutional knowledge production and you know procedures are kind of organized right the <clears throat> for us you know so the uh, uh uh so my question about uh, uh, this i have to really leave to historians you know eric's question about what urban history scholarship can do so but my, but my approach to that will be kind of you know conditioned by greater awareness of what people are already doing you know bringing theory and practice together okay uh, and finally, like uh, just a couple of thoughts on uh, on it, on Dita's you know question on kind of the the or concern, let's say about the the, the um, um, dangers or you know like uh, you know uh, uh, the uh, you know temptations of uh, theory, you know too much theory, you know so uh, so you know so I have a bit of like a you know, odd answer to this, you know, and, and this is why I kind of started with my biographical uh, background a little bit, you know, so, 
you know, for me, you know, there really is no distinction, you know, to be honest, you know, between theory and practice, you know, so, uh, uh, and this is why it is very important for me to uh, say, uh, and part because, you know, I'm sometimes, you know, labeled as some kind of a theory person, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, but, but, you know, so I had to remind myself, actually, and sometimes, uh, you know, some of my students and others, colleagues and friends that, look, you know, I became interested in theory, not because I was, you know, in grad school or like, you know, uh, doing this for a class or for any professional advancement reason. I became interested in theory, you know, in the, you know, in political uh, activism, just to make uh, some sense of the world and figure out, you know, uh, how, you know, what to do, you know, like in various, you know, particularly in the that Sri Lankan kind of situation, you know, in the late 80s. And uh, so, for, so, so this kind of, you know, distinction between theory and practice uh, has always seemed like a, like a false distinction to me, you know, like, uh, and, and the, uh, which is not to say that I don't uh, see or I don't understand your concern on it, Andita, because, uh, you know, when theory, uh, like anything else, you know, becomes professionalized, you know, in the institutional kinds of arrangements, you know, that we work with in universities, you know, uh, the whole like publishing industry and, and so on and so forth it's all too easy to see, you know, how this becomes like, uh, uh, you know, can evolve into a theory for its own sake and 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 becomes instru instrumentalized in various, you know, institutional and career advancement uh, uh, agendas and projects with an inevitable, you know, uh, metropolitan northern bias uh, as well. Uh, and uh, as a result, you know, detached you know, from uh, real uh, questions and uh, concerns. So I'm not dismissing your question, you know, but I'm, um, I'm concerned, but I'm also saying that in my own life, and, and, and this is not just my own life, I know many others for whom, like, you know, this theory practice distinction is a, like a, you know, uh, contrived, you know, spurious one, you know, like, and, uh, and my great examples, uh, you know, actually, Mike Davis, and, you know, Friedrich Engels, you know, since we are talking about uh, historians as well, you know, whatever, you know, so, so Engels is great work, you know, probably his greatest work, you know, other than, you know, the book on the peasant was in Germany, uh, the, the condition of the working class in England. Okay, like, you know, can you imagine a more concrete book? You know, like, I mean, the guy is going from one, like, you know, street corner to the next, you know, like, you know, like excruciating detail, you know, about the life, you know, in this new emergent mode of, you know, capitalism and uh, the kind of uh, rampant urbanization associated with it. But out of that concreteness and that, uh, like, you know, suffusion of detail emerges a perspective on class struggle and capital. Right. You know, so you can to such an extent that you can kind of say that, you know, it is Engels actually who made Marx a Marxist, you know, uh, you know, by writing this book. And uh, the uh, and similarly, you know, since I've you know just written and spoken about Mike Davis, you know, my my, my kind of, uh, 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 you know, I have an interesting relationship to Mike Davis. You know, I, I know him a little bit personally, you know, from my time in Los Angeles, but the way I, the way he first made an impression on me, I think uh, I should uh, say something about quickly. I uh, was uh, I did a master's degree in Los Angeles from 1989 to 1991 uh, at the University of Southern California in that neoliberal planning school, right? But okay, I lived in LA for two years. Uh, then moved to uh, the more radical, you know, planning school for my PhD at Cornell. And as soon as I got there in fall 1991, one of my, you know, lefty friends asked, oh, have you read, you know, Mike Davis's great book on Los Angeles, City of Quartz? And I was like, what, who are you talking about? I haven't heard of Mike Davis, you know? So I had spent two years at USC doing a planning master's degree, and I had not heard of Mike Davis. You know, this is how limited and professionalized and neoliberal the curriculum was there, you know, and so I bought the Mike Davis book because I trusted my friend, 
but I was so into like, okay, reading Gramsci and the Frankfurt School, you know, I was, uh, you know, Susan Buckmoss, you know, the great Frankfurt School scholar was, uh, was on my PhD committee and so on. So Mike's book, you know, City of Quads sort of was on my desk, but I, I, I you know, it just, you know, it was there, I, I didn't get to it, you know, until April, 1992, you know, when I, you know, saw on television, you know, my old neighbor in Los Angeles going up in flames, you know. So I picked up the book, you know, could not put it down. I read it in uh, one sitting, right, uh, cover to cover. And uh, and I was mesmerized because he actually predicts in 1990 what was going to happen in 19, uh, April 1992. I'm referring to the, you know, notorious, you know, what is called the Rodney King riots, right? The And uh, I was blown away by the analysis, you know, of uh, Los Angeles, and part, particularly because this is a city that I had lived in for two years with already a politicized left, you know, background, you know, from Sri Lanka, and as a student of urban planning, you know, no less, you know, so, but I did, I mean, I, of course, I knew there were some problems, you know, and so on, racism and, you know, like uh, segregation and all that, but I had, I could live for two years without uh, really understanding that, you know, the thing was about to blow up, right? Uh, whereas Mike saw it. So my, uh, my question then was, how did Mike Davis know, uh, 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 you know, uh, see in Los Angeles what I could not see, right? Uh, and many others could not see either, you know, including you know, people who were teaching at the University of Southern California at the time, you know, in planning. So the, uh, uh, so I, uh, so this led me to kind of take Mike's work very seriously, you know, not just like to understand what he says about, I mean, you know, the details about Los Angeles, but I was more interested in uh, his sort of, how he saw things that others could not see, right? And how, uh, and of course, you know, how he, his writing style as well. Uh, as a historian. So my my kind of uh, answer to the, this question, how could he see in LA what others could not see? I think it is because of his theoretical perspective, you know, like a critical theoretical perspective, you know, so this is not immediately evident, you know, when you read City of Quartz and, you know, various uh, books like that, because it's all about, as you say, the concrete, the details, uh, you know, the lived experience and so on and so forth and the struggles. But, you know, you can't put it all together like that without a serious critical theoretical perspective, you know. And 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 so if you know other parts of Mike's work, you know where it comes from, you know, his work with the Naval Life Review people and his reading, you know, hanging out with Sartre, I mean, sorry, Mark Uzer, reading Sartre and, you know, uh, Althusser and various other people. In his reading groups and uh, and you know like yeah working with you know people like Perry Anderson you know Robin Blackman uh, and so on at the at New Life Review you know so the uh, so he has a kind of a theoretical critical theoretical perspective that he doesn't uh, like care to wear on his sleeve you know or it's not very evident you know but I think there is a kind of a important. Uh, uh, organic unity of you know the, uh, a theoretical perspective and the ability to narrate the concrete right uh, that comes together in Mike's work uh, which for me is a uh, model you know like uh, of uh, uh, scholarship right in uh, the fields relevant to us so these are long-winded way of saying you know that uh, I don't really see uh, you know like a fundamental distinction between theory and practice. And we don't, uh, you know, when it uh, when we encounter this, you know, because of the institutional, uh, you know, circumstances and the kind of the pressures under which some of us operate, we should simply reject this, you know, and resist this and kind of insist on the, on the unity, you know, organic unity of uh, theory and practice, you know, without making artificial divisions. Thanks so much. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, one is that, you know, I think what, what you say is true about the institutions, that uh, we are siloed and that um, it's very 
hard to really understand how somebody coming up in uh, urban theory or urban history can also absorb uh, what the huge amounts of uh, literature that are in both of them. And was, for that reason, I also appreciate your bibli bibliographical references in the world of theory. Um, and of course, we know that urban history is an immense phenomenon itself that much, much is much, much larger than Mike Davis um, as a as a sort of semi-historian, we, we sort of adopt him as a historian, but he's also, you know, uh, you know, he, he's only one of many, many, many. Um, and so, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that there is really a, a huge amount to, to absorb on both sides of the theory history um, divide is, 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 a, is a huge obstacle. Um, one we're hoping to slowly but surely make um, easier to, 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 um, to surmount. Uh, I, I want uh, Rosemary and Kenny to lead us out. We're getting close to two hours, and I think that's uh, an adequate beginning. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to um, ask if um, I, I noticed a few of you have have stayed on that I don't I haven't met before. Lorraine, Rahema, uh, Flora, are, are there any of you uh, somebody who's named F H? Any of you want to say quick quick hello and 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 say where you are and 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 what your what your work is? Probably I can just introduce myself. I am going to be attending the Utedu workshop this coming April. So that's how I came to know about this platform. Uh, thank you. It's a great platform. I work at the University of Sheffield at the Urban Institute. So my area really is around cities and climate change. So that's my focus. So looking at climate action, climate innovation, but also linking it to issues around urban climate resilience with a particular focus on the global south and heavy interest in the African space. And it's interesting what has been said earlier on. I am from Zimbabwe, but I've never worked in Zimbabwe or in Africa. I left a long time ago to study and all sorts. So I feel now is the time that I'm sort of coming back into the space to see what I can contribute as somebody who has been a practitioner in United States, in Europe, being based here in England, and really seeing how I can give back uh, in whatever shape or form, but also it's an opportunity to understand the space, the continent, the people, and really work from the bottom up, because I've seen very much, you know, just using that South-North dichotomy, just how the global North dominates. So I'll leave you there, but this is a great platform where hopefully I'll keep on engaging because it opens up interesting and fascinating questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rahema. And absolutely, yes, we can have five or 10 more minutes. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. Uh, I did say to you guys, um, apologies, I was in the office and now I'm just got home. But for me, it's interesting, first and foremost, I'm Rahema, I am a construction manager by profession. Um, I'll be joining the Utadu 20. 23 cohort and I came to know about this because of the Tadu platform. Um, for me, this is all very new because I don't come from theory. I do come from this other side we call practice. Um, and it's interesting listening to terminologies that normally people in practice never actually use. People do not ever say something like neoliberalism on site. So that is all very new, very interesting, and I'm more than excited to explore what this is and what this can be. So myself, I'll be figuring out what theory actually is, but from the practice side. And this was a very good discussion. Um, we have never met most of these people. I've met Wangoi and Kenny. Um, I'm not sure if they'll remember, but I'm looking forward to the interview. Thank you. Flora, are you within uh, hearing distance right now? Do you care to just I, say quick words of who you are? Can you hear me though? Yes. Oh, awesome. Thank you. I'm driving. I think I can chew gum and walk at the same time. Of course you can. But I'm doing the, I'm the, I'm doing the school run. My name is Flora Nguye Mutere. I'm a lecturer at the Technical University of Kenya. I'm a multimedia designer. I'll be joining the Utadu 2023 cohort. Um, I am a PhD uh, student candidate at the Technical University of Kenya, 
and I am um, studying a gap in the museum, which talks about the past of Nairobi and um, positing that this information is really important to create identity and belonging for the present citizens, so long as we fill that gap. And I hope to do this in, in uh, a practice-based project. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the workshop in April and thank you for having me. Great, thank you so much. Um, somebody by the name of FH, uh, do you wanna say hello? Are you in audio range? Nicholas B, anyone? Okay, that's that's fine. Um, glad to have you with us and uh, hope to uh, meet you in person someday um, or again on the Zoom. Uh, Rosemary and Kenny, why don't you take us to um, to the end and maybe Whoops, any last um, minute thoughts from the audience? We'll have those too at this point. I don't want to have the last word. Um, if I, I also don't want to hand it off to Rosemary if she doesn't want to do that, uh, take on that job. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to maybe respond uh, briefly to An Anindita's point and also the question that was raised about the theory from below. Um, and you know, I, I come from a pretty straightforward um, PhD in history, but then, uh, or in you know, architecture and urban history, um, that's a distinction. Um, but then, um, have really been roped into um, urban urban theory and and urban uh, southern urbanisms through the collaboration with Cape Town in the uh, master's program that I'm teaching. And what I found really inspiring is that uh, in that is. Um, to question a little bit this idea of top-down and bottom-up uh, theory and to consider that theory is, is always um, embodied. Um, and so to say, I have no theory, it's perhaps the most um, dangerous thing to do then because one always has an implicit sense of, um, of the world. Um, so perhaps it's better to be explicit about that, um, about one's, one's position. Um, and then to think about theory making um, as a kind of practice. So the, the doing, of, of urban theory following Utadu's um, um, a ma mantra. Um, and so to think about the kinds of collaborations, um, and I think um, Flora's point also about, um, you know, why history matters, let's say of the uses of history that um, Beverly was talking about. I think we should really think about moving beyond this idea that it's only either about heritage um, and de therefore in the interest of elites, um, or about uh, historical claims, legal claims, but really think about the ways that we uh, want to do history uh, with urban constituents. Um, and so rather than relegating uh, his, uh, the kinds of you know, oral history uh, methods to another field, I think we should engage with that and think about um, that as part of a larger project um, of transformative research um, with communities. Rather, rather than you know, as a source of information to complement the archives, um, and so I think that's a really exciting way for me to think about how historical work can play a role um, in in um, in urban practice uh, in ways that are not reducible to you know heritage politics or or these um, these kind of limited um, um, instrumentalities um, of history. Um, yeah. I'll, I'll end with that. So just to say that, you know, of course, bottom-up history is great, um, but it, it can't do without theory. Go ahead, Rosemary. Yes, thank you, Carl. And I will keep this short. I, this has been a wonderful conversation. And Kenny, thank you for that. I, I couldn't agree more with you in how we um, need to move forward with the uses of, of history. Um, and to add to it, I would suggest that we need a, a, a real conversation about temporality um, that has held historians back in participating in this conversation. Um, and I would suggest uh, that temporality is also multi-scalar. Um, it is both local and global. Um, I think we are really in some ways desperate to hear from um, practitioners and scholars in the global South, Wangui from you in Africa and how you imagine and understand both your past and the present um, how you narrate those stories uh, that would give us much more insight into the reality of cities and the global experience, because what we have now in terms of, of uh, periodization and temporality is not very helpful. 
Um, so I would love to have a conversation by historians and by all of us um, about that about that topic. We need a critical temporality to go with the critical geography. Um, and, and lastly, just to very quickly to respond to Kanishka's very good work on nature in the city, I would also suggest that we need to think about biospheres and to use a much more ecological narrative in understanding the relationship between a city and a broader natural geography or a broader, a broader biosphere. Um, we need to really reconceptualize our language and our narration about that kind of geography, I'll call it, that kind of relationship between cities and metropolitan areas and put them in the context of a much broader understanding of ecology and nature. Um, I think that's critical going forward in particular in the world that we now exist in in the 21st century. And then uh, very quickly, lastly, I think that that biosphere is very much related to the fluidity of population that we must take into account in a much more serious way at a variety of level, levels, diaspora, migration, uh, rural to urban, urban to rural, et cetera. So I think we have uh, really extraordinary challenges. So I'm, I'm so delighted to, to find you all and to, and to be part of this. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Carl. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Rosemary. Uh, thanks <laughs> to everyone. Thanks for those of you who are still with us um, after this um, really long and, and very, very um, intricate uh, set of converse conversations, um, very, very layered um, counterpuntal con conversations. Um, and Kanishka, I want to just sort of thank you especially for setting us off on a kind of Biographical tact um, theory and autobiography uh, have a have a long um, metaphorical relationship, um, and I think you know we've made that really really strong. Just quickly to fill fill you in a little bit about you know me, I, I, I am a historian by training, um, you know, trained in North American history, who later on was told to to teach world history, and uh, gradually picked up many, many more perspectives on, on these narratives that, that were uh, very heavily Eurocentric um, as I learned them. Um, and then, you know, uh, lived in Buffalo, New York for many years and still I'm on the board of, a, of an organization called Push Buffalo that right now is, um, so my next, my next Zoom meeting is how to acquire land for affordable housing, um, green housing. Um, in in Buffalo, uh, how to, how to get a hold of this stuff at the time when that land is um, increasing in in, in price, um, but also somebody now who's really really thanks to you, Kanishka, you know, digging deep into into theory as well. I think I think all of these things interact, and 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 it's 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 a really uh, um, a deep deep intellectual um, problem that they. Us in, into separate silos. So that brings me back to Utadu, really, always oh, oh, over and again, <laughs> um, because I just feel like, you know, Wangui, what you've set out to do um, really can provide a very beautiful nucleus around which um, we can, um, you know, organize uh, conversations that break those silos down. And um, I, I look forward to how this could go forward, um, uh, you know, under your leadership, under the leadership of others who are willing to to um, step out of their comfort zones, um, to acknowledge that there are huge literatures out there that are uh, self-reflective and that are institutionalized and that are um, operating at a high speed and uh, volume uh, all around us and that are hard to really get a whole grip on, but yet are willing to share at least a, a perspective on that. And I think I think this idea of doing it through um, our own experience, uh, in individual experiences. I could see a conference where we actually just sat down and said, well, what are your intellectual biographies and, and how does it, how do those interact? And what, what have you read that we should um, put out there for you know, Kanishka to read or for, one way to read or for me to read um, in uh, uh, from from spaces that um, uh, were isolated uh, in, in, institutionally. So I, I look forward to this going on forward um, and this being just a kind of nucleus for um, a much a much more um, you know what what uh, uh, spaces where we could spend more time doing this.
Uh, so thank you very much. Kanishka, do you have any last uh, things you want to say to us? Because we're, we're we're here in part because we've uh, you've brought us together as well. Well, you know, you invited me, Carl. You know, so uh, I'm so grateful. You know, like uh, it's a great conversation, and I hope we can continue in, you know, how whatever way is possible. You know, so the uh, I just want to kind of not forget something that you know Wangui uh, asked uh, about, which I didn't really respond to, but thanks to Alexia, it's on the chat. You know, so and this is about you know how you know, ordinary people can become, you know, historical actors or subjects of history, let's say, you know, to put it in those weighty words, you know, so the, the uh, and ultimately, you know, this is kind of the, 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 the most important political question, you know, like, you know, because, you know, uh, for me, like, uh, I have, Kanishka, I think we lost you for just a few minutes there. I'm trying to, maybe if all the rest of us just take our video off a second. Um, we can re readjust that and then come back, please. The last bit. Oop. <laughs> no, we lost them all. Ending. <laughs> Yeah, that might be that might be the the signal that we're uh, almost done. Um, I'll, I'll give him a few few more right. seconds. Um, but anyway, I I, uh, I I look forward to the next conversation we can have. Wangui, we um, I, I I wish you well in the Thank in the you. April events. Um, and uh, Kenny will be there, so he'll have his perspectives on it. Lorraine uh, and Rahema, um, Flora, we hope to hear from you again too um, on all of this. Uh, the rest of us on this call know each other and and and, and speak to each other quite often. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll be planning, we'll be thinking, our, our wheels have, will be turning, believe me, um, as, we, as we go on, uh, for, go forward. Thanks so much, everyone. Really, really appreciate it. Yes, Bye -bye, great to everyone. see all of you. Okay. <laughs> Um, I'll make sure I keep the recording too here. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> Be well, everyone. Long week. See you. See you again soon. Best Thank wishes. You. Yeah. Sure thing.